All right, so I'm really honored to be introducing our next speaker. He's our keynote speaker at Sedona Wolf Week. Um, he'll be presenting several times on different issues, um, telling some stories at the Coexistence Dinner. Uh, about a year ago, I would say, Steve and I, my husband Steve and I, um, were introduced to the Working Circle Collaborative from the California um, Center, Wolf Center, and saw that they were going up north because wolves were being coming back into California. It's very new, hasn't happened in almost 100 years. And uh, what they did was they're a group of people who wanted to reach out to ranchers who have never experienced having wolves in their land, on their landscape, having to interact with wolves, and giving them some support, some education. And Steve and I thought it would be a really neat thing to do, but unfortunately we weren't able to go to any of the workshops that they were presenting in California. But there was one up in Oregon in a tiny, tiny little town, population of 400, called Bonanza up in Oregon. And we said, you know what, this is really important, we need to go. So we drove all the way up there. And we were kind of scared to walk in the door, I'll be honest, because, you know, we're wolf advocates from crystal crunching, Birkenstock wearing, Prius driving, California, vegan, you know, all that. And we're walking into this town of ranchers of, in Oregon, and we were, oh gosh, we hope they don't hate us, right? <laughs> and so we, we played it down, we walked in, we, we sat in the very back row, of course there were a lot of ranchers there, and, um, and we just kind of sat there. And everybody's talking to each other, and we didn't talk to anybody. We were just kind of like, hi. And then, all of a sudden, they, they, they called up the meeting or the workshop to order. And then they had us go around the room and introduce ourselves. And Steve and uh, one of our volunteers, Chelsea, and I looked at each other and went, oh, no. What are we going to say? So I basically went, hi. We're from California, and we just thought this was really, really interesting, and we're interested in figuring out how we can help. So we wanted to come and learn more. And that's, that's all I said. <laughs> I left it really vague. And I'll be honest, it was the most, probably, probably the most powerful workshop or experience that we have ever attended. Um, it completely changed our lives and our mission in a certain way. It kind of set us on a path realizing the plight of the rancher and the plight of the wolf and trying to help build a bridge in that and realizing that non-lethal coexistence is possible and that we wanted to help support that and support the ranchers in doing that and that's how the whole coexistence panel at Sedona Wolf Week was in, uh, created. But one of the gentlemen who spoke there um, really, really moved us um, he has an incredible life experience. He has been, for, he has gone from one end of the spectrum to the other in this whole controversy. So the knowledge that he has is beyond probably most. And um, he has this ability to talk. And no matter whether you're the most, um, you, the biggest wolf hater or the most passionate crazy wolf lover, he has this ability to communicate with everybody and have them open up and it really blew our minds. Um, and that's Carter Niemeyer. <laughs> Carter Niemeyer was a, a state trapper in Montana and a district supervisor for USDA Wildlife Services. In 1990, he became the Wolf Management Specialist for Wildlife Services covering Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, and conducted livestock de depredation investigations, wolf capture, and removal. Niemeyer was part of the wolf capture team in Canada during the reintroduction. He's the guy who darted them and got them on the, on the transport to get them for that very famous experiment, essentially. And in 2001, he was sought to run the USFWS Wolf Recovery Program in Idaho. He retired in 2006, and I think that's hilarious that he says retired because he's definitely not retired. He's still working his butt off. But he has also authored two memoirs, both of which are absolutely amazing, Wolfer and Wolfland. So if you get the opportunity to read either of those books or both, please do. And so with 
with much honor. I am so honored to introduce you, Carter. Thank you so much for coming uh, to sit on the Wolf Week. Carter Neumeyer. Yeah. Settlement, 
and they've gone through very many uh, morphological changes. But the problem is, as European settlement uh, increased, the problems that European settlers had increased. So first of all, you know, it's just uh, settling the country and, and then uh, you, know, you start fighting with ground squirrels, you start fighting with the jackrabbits, uh, all those different little critters out there. And then of course, you bring the livestock with you across the prairie. And uh, as you all know in history that um, the European settlers annihilated the buffalo and uh, many of the native species commercial hunted down many species till they almost didn't exist and uh, replaced those with sheep and cattle and, and various livestock they brought with them so then uh, if you look down the list a little ways farther you're going to start talking bird and mammal species and when you bring in livestock and, and you got animals like wolves and grizzly bears suddenly there's a further need so down in 1907, there was, a, there was an attempt by Congress to, to jettison and get rid of the agency back then. And that's another thing to pay attention to my talk, how wildlife services have many more than nine lives. Very hard if you think you're going to stamp them out. And there Theodore Roosevelt rock, walked in and said, bully for the biological survey. Okay, then uh, 1900s, talking about grazing, livestock on public lands, wolves and coyotes. 1905-1907, uh, the, the, even the U.S. Forest Service was involved in predator control issues at the time, along with the Biological Survey, which was the predecessor to uh, what we call wildlife services. And then uh, down the list of methods of killing, you'll see poisoning. Uh, that came on about that time, and poisoning is probably why the predators got hammered so bad during settlement times and why um, the wolves and, and most of those type of predators were killed off. It wasn't necessarily that they shot and trapped them all. They did that too, but poisoning really knocked them down fast. Again, here's more evolution, rodent control. Um, actually, when I started in Montana, my predecessor was more into killing rodents on national forest land uh, and all that. It was kind of uh, history by the time I came into the picture. 1917, talking wolf control, and then uh, down there's a couple of the. Uh, that's actually a book I still have, one of the old trapper books uh, from back in the 1930s. But again, there's another name change, but they're still around. So, uh, if you want to read about and look up the Animal Damage Control Act of 1931 kind of like the Mining Act of 1872. We operate under some very archaic laws today. And those laws are still on the books and we're still uh, under that guidance. And in those, uh, even in the wording of these original acts, you know, they talk about eradication. So it's not just kill a few, it's get rid of them. So uh, anyway, uh, direct Secretary of Agriculture to conduct campaigns for the destruction of animals interest to agriculture and livestock on national forest and public domain. So I mean, it's uh, again, we're talking private land, public land, everywhere and anywhere. And uh, I think I've still even got some more morphoses here again. When I went to work, uh, we were under the uh, Bureau of uh, Sport Fisheries and Wildlife when I went to work in Montana. Okay, here's a monumental change, 1986. Uh, when I went to work for them, they were Animal Damage Control, which is another name. And then um, 1986, the livestock industry were not satisfied that we were under uh, U.S. Department of Interior. Fish and Wildlife Service, they thought, well, if we can get this transferred politically to the USDA, we'll get more bang for our buck. So when I was working for them at that time, they moved us over, hoping that under USDA, DA get a better deal. And then uh, 1997 is when the ADC program changed to Wildlife Services. So if it's hard to keep track of these guys, I mean, it's a shell game and uh, they were alive in 1885, they're alive and strong today. So here's all the different methodologies. Um, you can read them here, but um, 
the primary tools that, that they're using today, especially for, to protect livestock, you know, are neck snares, foothold traps, uh, call shooting, um, but probably one of the most uh, deadly methods they use nowadays is in 1972, let's see if I've got that slide coming up, not yet. 1972, anyway, uh, when, when uh, toxicants were banned for the most part, with the exception of the M44 and the 10A collar, the taking away all that poison meant we got to find something just about as lethal that we can administer. And so uh, aerial hunting really became the replacement for toxicants. So we'll talk about that here too. So uh, let me tell you, within the infrastructure of wildlife services, you've got your rank and file infrastructure of state directors in each state of the United States with their supervisors. And to support them, uh, a key element is the Pocatello Supply Depot, which is in Idaho where I live. And that uh, entity started in 1933, it's still functional. The, the mayor of the city has recently tried to run him out of town because if you follow the news, a 14-year-old boy and his dog uh, triggered an M44 device. Like I say, there's a sample of one back there so you see what they look like. The dog was killed and the child almost died from it and still has some health issues with it. But in Pocatello, at the Pocatello Supply Depot, that's where M44 units are manufactured. And they've been through many phases. Uh, they originally were called a coyote getter, and they had a cartridge, a 38 caliber cartridge in them with a primer that shot cyanide. And that cyanide could come up face level, actually hit you perhaps in the uh, face or eyes and kill you if you just kicked it with your boot. So uh, they modified that device into an M44, which is spring-powered now and, and more of a poof kind of effect. Keeps the cyanide lower toward the target animal uh, and doesn't have these projectiles shooting up into your face. They also mix poison grain there. They, they, they got a lot of deadly little things they make at the Pocatello Supply Depot. Okay, so here, here's when the, in, under the Nixon administration, uh, this was a pretty significant uh, piece of legislation here. It got rid of most of the toxicants that had uh, been used by the government uh, since way back in settlement. And 1972, every, all the toxicants were banned, and then there was a process where uh, Wildlife Services was able to get registration back for the use of these M44s and for a 1080 collar that, that you put on the neck of a sheep, uh, has a little bladder on each side of the neck, and if the coyote punctures that when he's attacking the sheep, uh, it poisons it. Very few of them in use, by the way. They're just too, uh, too much maintenance. Uh, another important part of the infrastructure wildlife services is the uh, National Wildlife Research Center. When I went to work, they were in Denver. Now they've moved to Fort Collins. Again, that is the research branch of Wildlife Services, and this is where they look at all kinds of ideas, uh, lethal and non-lethal. Uh, they have scientists there, I mean, people with PhDs who are uh, some really good uh, wise people there, some friends of mine that are uh, very professional. Uh, but if uh, a trapper from the field comes in with an idea about something that could be better, uh, they'll actually design it there. and. Uh, in my career, if you get in to read my books, the one of those was the rag box, radio activated or radio automated guard. And I write about that in Montana when uh, we had a wolf problem over in the uh, Bitterroot Valley, close to Missoula. Even the rancher goes, well, can't you, why can't you just like put something on a wolf that when they come around our livestock, it'll trigger fireworks, you know, they'll have rockets shoot in the air and scare them away. And we had that discussion over dinner and we thought, huh, let's run it by. So we sent it to the National Wildlife Research Center, John Shivick, and he actually designed the first rag box for us. Uh, the first one weighed about 100 pounds, it took six of us to move it around the field, which thought this is stupid. Yeah, but then, gradually they modified it down in a quite, quite a little package, and, and it's uh, battery powered, and it had like a player, 
like in your car and put sound effects in there like breaking glass, galloping horses, gunfire, and, and all these sounds. And um, you put a radio collar on a wolf and the wolf triggers a control device within the rack box so that when the wolf closes in with a certain distance of the herds, it uh, sets off this electrical impulse inside and all these sound effects go off. And they're, and they're deafening and they're uh, actually very effective Hard on even the human's eardrums. So anyway, you can read about that uh, rag box. They're still out there, but somehow I think they're costing five or six thousand dollars now. When we built one, you know, out of Radio Shack, so even people could still probably do things cheaper. Um, while their services talk talk a lot of talk, but they don't always walk the walk. So they they emphasize in a lot of their literature that. They're uh, in the non-lethal, so you'll see pictures of dogs and fences and uh, quiet scenes. But actually, uh, they spend a lot more of their time looking at uh, a poison for potatoes, that you can bury the potato in the ground and hide it from all species except the feral hogs that can smell the potato underground and root the potato up and consume it and kill it. So I mean, there's delivery mechanisms they're still working on on how to uh, you know effectively take out species. Oops. My thing is falling apart here. Okay. Um, one really crucial contribution I think wildlife services made to uh, predator management over the years is back in 1980s when I was working in Montana they started into this uh, guard dog research and they've done a lot, and uh, Dr. Jeff Green and Dr. Roger Woodruff. Uh, Roger became the State Director of Wildlife Services in Washington, and Dr. Jeff Green became our uh, Assistant Regional Director for the uh, Western Program as they moved up through the ranks. Both of them had doctorate degrees, and essentially they just took all these different guard dog breeds from Europe and started raising them and going through training uh, procedures and such to see which of these dogs would work good for livestock producers. And I think from the 1980s to say today, uh, almost anyone who has sheep have at least some kind of a guard dog with them. And when you look at the sheep bands, the nomadic bands in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and other states too, where several thousand sheep are watched by a herder and they're moving through the mountains, um, because of wolves, they've added maybe five or six guard dogs per band. You've got to have enough that they represent a, a canine pack that will intimidate wolf packs to stay away. But you get too many guard dogs, then they start to wander, they start to fight, and they sometimes even start killing sheep because they're bored. So you got to, that's part of what we're looking at too, is what's the right blend, what's the right mix. Uh, Pyrenees guard dogs are, are a real popular breed. Uh, some people wanted more aggressive ones, but the problem we got into was when you went to a more aggressive breed on public land, you got what they call hikers and mountain bikers, and them dogs tended to look at a biker as an invasive species too. So the guard dogs are biting people on public land, and that creates some real serious management problems for the Forest Service, BLM, and the rancher. So, and they're still looking at, at guard dogs today. All right, so, I wasn't nothing but aerial gun coyotes. And this is a picture of one day when I was gunning, I just stepped aside and that's our pilot, but we would get in these uh, helicopters. We start out the old MASH helicopters, Bell 47, piston driven ones, and then uh, moved to these Hughes 500 sports cars Type helicopters, but you cannot believe how long if a coyote gets in our sights, he's dead. He can't outrun the helicopter. And in the winter time is when they really hit them hard. Uh, you could fly out in that open country. Every coyote silhouette that showed up. I mean, I even after a while you just get sick of it. Even a lot of the trappers said too, it just ain't even fair because uh, very seldom would a coyote get away unless he run into thick timber. So we shot him by the hundreds. And there's days we would kill over 100 in one day, one helicopter. 
And my job at the time too was pulling fuel trailer, gunning, and skinning. So I skinned uh, over 6,000 coyotes during my time on the ground underneath the helicopter. Uh, we saved the pelts, sold the money, or sold the pelts for money that went into the Wool Growers Predator Fund, which bought fuel for the helicopter. Self, uh, self-serving, self-perpetuating. Um, since then, coyote pelts have of lesser value, so uh, now they shoot them and let them lay wherever they drop. And landing too is always dangerous. Takeoff landings are the most critical part. Uh, so when the coyote isn't worth much, then nobody's going to risk a million dollar helicopter to pick one up. And the other key words to be aware of is corrective and preventative control. Corrective control is when you got two coyotes, for an example, killing somebody's sheep. And we would go in with whatever tools it took and we'd kill those two coyotes. Problem solved, uh, sheep safe, move on. But a big component of wildlife services is preventative control. And that means running them helicopters all winter, trying to knock out the coyote population, knock it down by spring before they made it, and then hit them hard again in February when they were breeding. Uh, once they established territories, they kept other coyotes out of the area. So we had all these strategies, how to kill coyotes, to get the most bang for the buck, and to minimize the impact of these coyotes on producers. Uh, and, but there's no consideration of any other value of those coyotes other than preventative control means we kill that coyote because it might kill a sheep. And even though most of the coyotes out there are eating rabbits and ground squirrels and mice and small mammals, uh, Wildlife Service has been worried about that. Um, I say back then, I say now, they're the hired gun of the livestock industry. Uh, and so another part of my work at the time was that because of my college education and a and, uh, little more technologically inclined, um, dealing with grizzly bears, trappers didn't want to learn about mobilizing drugs or doing all that, you know, they didn't hire me to know what a milligram or a milliliter is. <laughs> so let the college educated boy do that. So I was the uh, dark guy and the, and the mobilizing drug fellow in our outfit. We always worked as two men crew. Uh, that grizzly bear is alive. He's just sedated. He's right in the rancher's uh, barnyard, right? 50 yards from the house. And uh, throughout my career, 16 years of uh, capturing problem grizzlies, so we never killed one on my watch. I mean, that was not our job to kill them. We relocated them all or turned them over to uh, management agencies to move them. So uh, I will say I never killed a grizzly, and I don't intend to. Oops. Okay. Um, when I hired on the wildlife services, I never, wolf wasn't even in my vocabulary or my consideration. I never thought about them or that we ever worked with them. In 1986 to 87, wolves started naturally recolonizing from Canada and started coming into the North Fork of the Flathead on the west side of Glacier Park and then onto the Blackfoot Indian Reservations uh, near Browning, Montana. And uh, suddenly, in a very short transformation time, because of my technological inclination, Niemeyer can solve the wolf thing. So I was the guy designated by Wildlife Services to come up with uh, techniques to catch wolves, locate traps, um, find the knowledge, the skill, and the tactics to catch wolves because uh, anybody who knew about that uh, were long dead or retired and, and it was all history. So. Um, it spiced up my career and it brought about that transition, that change in me from being worried about being a coyote killer to uh, being a wolf technician. So uh, I just show you examples here. I, I became Carter the darter and then Carter the net gunner and Carter the trapper. Uh, so these are some wolf pups that uh, first time, I think I darted the first wolf in the lower 48 states because the Great Lakes states weren't using that capture method. And then here, uh, I net gunned some wolf pups because they were too small to be hitting with these uh, projectiles. So I got to probably net gun the first wolves in the lower 48 states. And then uh, 1987 to 2002, we did a lot of wolf capture and relocation. 
And again, my job was to do that for the most part. So uh, many wolves rode in the helicopter with us on the way back to the, to the confinement pen. And uh, during that period, 87 to 2002, we caught 117 wolves that we relocated and didn't kill them because we thought they were critical to uh, wolf recovery. And when you handle this many wolves, I've caught just myself personally in my career now, I've handled uh, or captured 300 wolves. And I've never had one die on me yet. And I've helped colleagues handle hundreds more. Uh, during this time of handling these live animals and transporting them and mobilizing them and feeling like we were kind of running a mobile vet clinic, I lost all desire to kill predators. This, this uh, just changed me into a whole different guy and, and I thought, you know, with your background, your education, you could be doing better things than this. So uh, again, I, I wrote two memoirs, but in Wolfer you can read that story and I think you'll find uh, fascinating and, and uh, easy reading. So meantime, back at the ranch, um, these numbers are dynamic. They vary from year to year. Um, wildlife services is still killing a lot of critters and I know it's upsetting to a lot of people and some critters are going to have to be killed because sometimes you just can't solve a problem any other way. But I will say they're liberally killed if somebody doesn't watch them and put the brakes on. That's your purpose in life here today if you want something to do is monitor and question and determine what's going on in your state with wildlife services, what they're doing. And there are new methods of animal husbandry and non-lethal techniques that can be used to reduce conflict with wildlife. And people are spoiled because if there's an agency like Wildlife Services that you can pick up the phone and call and they'll be at your door probably within 24 hours administering control, uh, why do you have to be responsible? Why do you have to take any responsibility yourself? We have a government agency that will come and snuff out my problem. And looking around here, like, perfect place, Sedona, look at all these houses going up the mountain, going out into the back country. We're moving right into the backyard of mountain lions, black bears up in our country, grizzly bears. And people need to be aware of that. And you can keep your garbage locked up and you can keep your bird feeders monitored. And there's, there's all these things you can do that doesn't require some government hunter to walk in, turn his hounds out, run the cougar up your orchard tree or the bear and shoot it. So uh, but once these animals become a problem, once conflict starts, many of your state agencies say, we're not going to deal with it. We, and we'll call up our partners, Wildlife Services, who have agreements with most state wildlife management agencies. Wildlife Services will come, come in and take care of it. and. And at least work in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. If a lion's in trouble, they don't relocate them. If a bear, black bear's in trouble, and even now, like Wyoming, a lot of grizzly bears, if they get in trouble, they're dead. So uh, if you could, you know, the old saying, a fed bear is a dead bear, and it, it goes for other species too. So uh, if you want, and go out and go out on the internet and look around, USDA Wildlife Services. Uh, if you type into your state, Arizona, Idaho, whichever, they have these little two-page poop sheets and you can read about them. And you're going to find out that every state varies dramatically. Every state director does things his way based on the local politics, based on the local species. So what uh, we do, for example, in like Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming is very, very different than what Washington and Oregon to the west of us do. The uh, programs over there, uh, all right, let me just say, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. What do we mainly focus on? Usually uh, coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, black bears. And it's pretty much a diet of predator problems, large predator problems, killing livestock. And we have a federal budget that is pretty much federal tax dollars that, that feed our Western programs but once you go toward the coast, you know, 
they've got salmon and they've got birds that eat salmon. So my compadre over in Washington might spend all day sitting on a river like the Columbia shooting cormorants, shooting seagulls, shooting birds by the hundreds, by the thousands. They get permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service to kill uh, a certain number of these. And then they put oil on the eggs of these nesting seabirds that eat salmon. And uh, my compadres in Washington and Oregon, too, they have to drum up contracts where Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, we pretty much get federal money to do the job. Those guys got to beat the streets and get contracts to shoot feral pigeons from under bridges uh, and, and killing uh, whatever the species is exotic to that area. I mean, sometimes they're working on sea otters and, and various critters. Nutria, beaver, where, where you got space with more water. Uh, those are problems they deal with where, in contrast, they, uh, we were just talking this morning, Montana, you got enough private trappers who go out and kill beaver that the state of Montana's wildlife services program doesn't really budget for that because uh, private industry takes care of it themselves. So be aware of that variation. And sitting around a campfire 20 years ago in Cortez, Colorado, um, I broke bread with a bunch of trappers from Arizona and New Mexico. I don't know what they're doing today, but at the time I was even uh, surprised, fascinated, astounded, appalled. Uh, but they, like we kill coyotes up in Montana, they kill a certain percentage of mountain lions every year before they ever kill anything. You just go into certain areas where livestock are going to go and they kill 15, 20 cougars. One well, legal, uh, encouraged, the state endorses it. Uh, check on that today. I, I don't know if it's still going on, but it probably is. <coughs> and uh, up there in Montana, I was, you know, had a little higher regard for a mountain lion than to be killed by vermin. So again, here, here's just uh, 2016, here's some of the kill figures again of, of the animals that go down. And uh, wildlife services, I mean, working for them, we don't spend the day worrying about whether we're destroying a family or we're destroying the social life of a wolf pack or, you know, all the touchy-feely. It's business. What's the problem? Where is it? We go in, confirm the problem, and uh, removal begins. Uh, most of the bear... Bear uh, control is with foot snares or culvert traps, and uh, mountain lions, a good share of that's handled with uh, hound dogs. Just turn the hounds loose, tree them, kill them. And then when you get down to this 2.7 million animals, uh, a lot of those are non-native species, like European starlings. Starlings get into dairies and poop in the feed and, and can spread disease. Uh, so wildlife services, uh, they have a uh, Poison called DRC 1339, and that DRC, Denver Research Center. It's a specific poison. You put it on French fries, or you can inject it in eggs, and put it in these feed bunks um, where you pre bake the starlings in, and, and thousands of them consume and kill themselves with that stuff. And then you read in the paper about a town who goes to bed and wakes up in the morning and there's 500 dead birds laying on, under a tree in your front yard where they went to roost. That's often a result of something like the DRC 1339. And uh, emphasize here, the Wildlife Society generally advocate. I mean, when I went to college, predator control is a wildlife management technique they teach you in college. So it's not just something out there that uh, this, this wildlife, uh, wildlife services do against the grain of the American public. Uh, it's very much supported by uh, academia and is supported by professional wildlife societies. 2017, $122 million budget. And uh, again, if you look at the little poop sheets, they, on the second page, they show kind of a pie chart in that state. Uh, where their funding proportionally comes from. And uh, again, if you're like in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, most of the money comes from federal tax dollars with a little bit of cooperative funds from ranchers. But you get over in Washington and Oregon, uh, 
probably two thirds of their budgets come from cooperator funding that uh, the people they're helping are giving them money to for. Um, give them credit again too, Wildlife Services have uh, branched out now. Um, again, it's a lifeline to them. They protect airports from bird strikes, so any of you that use airliners, there's probably a Wildlife Services technician working those uh, runway areas, helping those airports to find ways to persuade Canada geese and other species to stay away from the runways so they, that they're not hit on takeoff or, or struck uh, on the ground during takeoff. Uh, another lifeline to them is feral hogs. There's roughly five million feral pigs or hogs in the United States today. And I think the uh, state of Texas uh, they're receiving like $22 million now, and they spend that aerial gunning hogs a good share of the time. Again, those pigs are aerial gunned and dropped, and that's, they, they don't pick them up. They're just uh, vermin, and they're non-native. So they do uh, attack these non-native species, and, and being sarcastic, I wish Wildlife Services did more of the non-native work and less worrying about ways of killing our native predators to protect non-native livestock. <laughs> the irony. Especially cows and sheep. Horses, believe it or not, historically they walked this uh, North American continent, and camels did too, believe it or not. So, um, the things you hear, and I've heard through my whole career, and I've read through books written back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there are Residents of the United States doing everything in their power to modify or reform wildlife services, get rid of them, terminate them. And I will tell you, Wildlife Services has lots of friends in Congress. Very, very hard to get Congress to do anything too negative to Wildlife Services. And every time there's a talk about cutting back on Wildlife Services program somewhere statewide, the county commissioners jump in, legislators jump in, the governor jumps in, then your congressman is notified, and they talk to their eastern congressmen who don't know about the western program, but are convinced after their western colleague explains how we provide the food and fiber of the country and these things are killing the hell out of things and they're talking about taking away our wildlife services program. Uh, it's almost died years and years in a row, but always made a comeback and they're still going strong. Um, latest battle is with M44s. There's an attempt, again, to try to get them banned, outlawed, and no longer in use. Wildlife services, what they do is they offer to temporarily quit using them. And two weeks later, you all forget about M44s and you get tied up in other problems. Slowly in the back rooms of Congress and, and through wildlife services, uh, negotiating, Slowly they start using them again. Slowly they come back, and before long, uh, one day you find out they're back. And uh, the smoke is cleared, and nobody knows it, and you're all distracted, and you have to go through this all over again. So, you have illusions of getting rid of them when you go home tonight. It may not happen. But again, there is other ways to do things than just killing things. And we don't have time today, but killing is a short-term solution to a long-term problem because animals have the ability to come back. Um, coyotes, best example, we killed coyotes. We've tried to exterminate them for 100 years. What did they do in response? They spread over the lower 48 states. They, uh, these animals disperse. Actually, killing coyotes makes coyotes healthy because of survivors have more space, more room, more food, uh, healthy litters, those litters have more food because competition has been killed by hunters, trappers, and wildlife services. So uh, they maintain in spite of all that. So I thought hopefully I didn't go too long so you can maybe ask questions instead of me talking at you. But that's the condensed version of wildlife services. Yep. Is there any online source where somebody is tracking what the federal wildlife services does that we might think is questionable? 
Defenders of Wildlife, Center for Biological Diversity, of Wild Earth Guardians, um, and I'm forgetting a whole bunch. And then there's Casey uh, York's back there at the table where she's, um, you know, she's dealing with trapping issues. We got uh, Lisa Robertson working on the trapping issues down in Wyoming. There's a lot of people. And I'll tell you, you know, my wife and I, we, where we put our money is into uh, environmental law firms. We support advocates for the West in Boise. Um, I don't belong to anything anymore. I've quit all organizations. You know, I've, I've quit the Elk Foundation. I quit them. I donated money to the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation because they were buying habitat for elk. That's a very noble thing to do and, and power to them. And then they got into wolf. Uh, you know, beating the wolf issue to death politically, and I told them they shouldn't be doing it, and they told me don't let the door hit you, and so I parted company with them. You know, the NRA, well, you brought wolves here because you're trying to disarm us, take away all our weapons, uh, kill North American big game hunting. No, I'm a hunter. That's all wrong. But I don't need the NRA to represent me anymore. So I don't belong to anything, but I do give my money to environmental law firms because uh, they're the watchdogs, and sometimes that's the only way you're going to stop what's going on. And um, advocates, our example is they win about 85, 90% of their cases, including against the federal government, which tells me somebody is not doing things appropriately. That was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> but there's a, yeah, there's a lot of groups monitoring uh, what's going on. And, there's a lot of lawsuits going on. I couldn't begin to tell you all of them, but wildlife services are being sued in Oregon, they're being sued in Washington, they're being sued in Idaho, for examples, and probably other places too, currently. Well, thank you very much. And